I'm really so delighted to be here and to see so many of you on the call today. Um, but really, it's time that people understood that, you know, dementia and memory loss is not a natural part of aging. And so we need to understand what we can do really starting today to take better care of our brains. Um, so I'm going to, we'll get into the kind of the format of today, but the one thing I want to say before we start is that um, what we've learned during COVID-19 is that we all need to take responsibility for our own health and well-being. Um, and, you know, the, the more well we can be, the better our immune systems, the um, just the lower, you know, rate of comorbidities that, that we can have really will help us through really any kind of virus or, um, you know, bacteria, anything that we might be exposed to. So this is what you're going to hear about today. Um, much of what I'm going to share with you is new. Like Sharp Again was founded, um, in 2012 and we were we were all by ourselves for quite a long time but the rest of the world has caught up and so the, the idea of neuroplasticity and that the brain can shrink and then actually regain volume all of these these ideas are really relatively new we're also going to talk about the causes of memory loss so we're going to share with you a list that sharp again has compiled um, we're monitoring the research so we can potentially add to this list as we've done over the last few years. We're only going to be able to take a deep dive today into two of them because there's a lot of information and they're complex. However, what we would hope for you to take away from the presentation today are one or two or even more steps that you will start to do to take better care of your brain. So as we go through the presentation, I'm going to share with you different ideas, different, you know, information, some steps. Um, and you may just want to take some notes and, and write them down, especially if they apply to you. Okay, so I see where I have to advance it at the bottom. It's different than my other uh, way I was doing it. So we're unique. So Sharp Again Naturally, 501c3 nonprofit, founded in 2012. And we were primarily for many years an educational nonprofit. So we've, we've spoken to public groups, um, medical groups, um, and our purpose is really to monitor this information and bring it to everyone, empowering them to take steps like we're doing today to take charge of their cognitive health. Um, we are, we have a lot of health coaches on our board um, who work with us. We have integrative physicians, naturopaths, osteopaths, um, many doctors who have kind of gone beyond their basic training to support, you know, we all know that lifestyle changes can improve cognition. And so we're here to support you in doing that. Um, what we have seen is there's no, as yet one magic bullet or a pill that is going to return people to full, you know, sharp cognition. Like once your mind, your brain starts to um, show signs of memory loss, um, it's, it's going to take some work to get it back. But the one thing we know is that the sooner you start, the better. Um, so we created a medical and dental advisory board. We partner with them and other organizations and like-minded professionals to disseminate this information and also to support um, the activities and the research. Even though we don't contribute directly to research, we, I'm in touch with researchers all the time. Um, who are looking for some ideas and, and some guidance because we really are like the boots on the ground. We talk directly to the end user. Um, so 
Um, the way that we are involved is that, as I mentioned, we provide the education. We have programs we've developed over the last year or so, which I'll tell you more about later, to help operationalize our mission, to really take the education and help people implement it. We have, um, and the way we've been able to do that is as more people have come to Sharp again to become involved and to volunteer, like I said, many of these are, are health coaches and they, this is their bread and butter. They are used to helping people make those small, take those small steps to make lasting change. And then finally, it's not coming in, but, uh, I don't have that slide right here. Okay, so whatever that last thing was, we're going to just move on. Um, so dementia does not discriminate. You know, we're talking about so any anyone really, um, as we've seen, can get dementia or start to experience memory loss. Um, what we've learned over the last couple of years actually has started to change this a little bit in that we know some people are protected with more education or if they have the means to have full testing and treatment, um, they can be, be helped. Um, if they have access to better food, for instance, or they at least have the ed education to know what kind of food will help their brain, that does help. But basically, if you look at the population of people who have memory loss, it's everybody, regardless of race, your socioeconomic status, um, women and men. Um, it does happen over a long period of time. So it comes on really slowly, typically, although sometimes it doesn't, but Typically, it's just very small changes. The, there are more women typically, and I think that's because more often they are caregivers. And you see this very scary statistic that they're six times more likely to get dementia themselves. Because what happens is when you become a caregiver, you actually start to live the lifestyle of the person that you're caring for. You may not be getting out socially as much. You may not be eating well. You may not be sleeping as well. You may be under undue stress. Um, a lot, you'll see a lot of the risk factors for dementia are part of this scenario. And then we will talk a little briefly, but we will talk about how lifestyle, genes, and environment all play a role in this. So, Mild to moderate cognitive impairment has been successfully treated. I just want to stop there for a minute. We, we have seen cases turn around. We've seen many of them turn around. So this is really good news for all of us. Once diagnosed, we know that early intervention is the best step to take. So while it used to be we wanted to hide, um, we were losing our memories, our spouse or our friends might cover for us. Um, there was a lot of shame around memory loss. People waited as long as they could to reach out and get help. And I'm telling you the opposite is true today. If you start to notice a problem, you wanna to try to get help right away. Genetics, which is typically thought to be that APOE4 gene, um, you get one from mom, one from dad, so you're going to get either, uh, you'll have any, any combination of twos, threes, and fours. The twos and the threes are not particularly problematic, although the threes do raise your risk just a, a little bit. But that APOE4 gene, if you have one, and unfortunately, if you have two, it really does um, you know, exponentially incre increase your risk. But we have seen even people with those genes, uh, that allele, it's not predictive that they'll get dementia. They're, again, epigenetics will trump genetics. 
Um, you may have to work hard, but you can do it. And start now. So, I mean, I'll make a big case for prevention. Um, it's, I know, really hard to get motivated when you have no symptoms. I'm hoping today will start you on that path so that you start to take steps now um, before we have any signs of memory loss. So for people who don't know, I'm just gonna spend a minute on this. Mm -hmm. Dementia is a broad umbrella term that encompasses many types of cognitive decline. And some of these are listed here. So memory loss, short and long-term, executive functioning, problem solving, um, orientation, judgment. And then these different types of dementia are things you've probably heard about. So vascular dementia, which are like small strokes that can lead to some, some issues with memory. Lewy body dementia, frontotemporal, Alzheimer's, which is thought to be the most common type. Now, they say that 70% of all dementia cases are Alzheimer's disease, and they're characterized by plaques and tangles in the brain, which most of us have heard. But I have to share with you that many people who have plaques and tangles in their brain don't have memory loss. So it's not the total definition, and I'm, I'm not saying we know what the, what the full definition is, but there is this other piece that we don't understand. And for that reason, many diagnoses are misdiagnoses because there are many things you can have that resemble the symptoms of Alzheimer's, but that is not Alzheimer's disease itself. I mean, one of those things, for example, is heavy metals toxicity, mercury toxicity. So if you're suffering from mercury toxicity, you will act and behave as if you have dementia, but that's something that can be treated. So that's just an example. And again, from the very beginning, Sharping and Naturally has believed that until all the possible causes that we know of are tested and treated, you'll never know whether somebody's case can't be turned around. So these are, this is a continuum, which I think is really important for, you know, our discussion today, because that first um, stage, if you will, of cognitive decline, which is subjective cognitive impairment, you might feel that something's not right, like your memory is not operating the way it used to. And granted, as we age, even from the age of 30 on, our processing speed does slow down a little bit. But I think that on some level, we all know when something's changed. Unfortunately, if you go to a neurologist, their mental testing that they do is not sensitive enough to pick up this stage of cognitive impairment. So you, you have to get worse in order to get diagnosed so that you know you have a problem in that mild cognitive impairment stage. So I'm encouraging us all when we think something's not right to try to get help for it. And that's really what Sharp Again's here for. The next stage, so, so mild cognitive impairment, many people can function fairly well. They can still be engaged in activities. Um, they can still watch a webinar and get a lot out of it. Um, it's when it progresses to the moderate stage where they're having difficulties with their activities of daily living um, or, or their tasks such as uh, driving or maybe you know, preparing meals that they used to prepare or getting the household tasks done or um, perhaps they used to be really good at numbers. You know, uh, often men will see that at work. They're not as able to work with numbers um, and then finally, it advances to a severe stage where people need constant supervision. So just briefly, I wanted to tell you about some of the breakthrough research because it's ongoing and it's very exciting. So in 2014, we were delighted to hear that on the West Coast, 
a medical researcher by the name of Dr. Dale Bredesen had actually come out with a study uh, showing that this, this multi-therapeutic approach that many things can be going on at the same time to impact <laughs> memory, that he was able to help nine out of 10 people. And he has now many years later published more papers and has many, many more people that have been helped. And later this year is coming out with a book with one of the people he helped actually um, to chronicle um, case studies, successful, successful case studies. And, you know, I will tell you that that tense subject, because I've spoken to Dr. Bredesen about this, at the time they weren't testing for heavy metals the way that we do now. Um, that it's possible that person might have been helped. The other thing too is that again, as people get further down that road of memory loss and get to that sort of late mild to moderate stages, it's harder to turn these cases around. But he did come out with his book in August of 2017, as you'll see there on the right, called The End of Alzheimer's. And there's a lot of great information in that book. And you know, one thing that we, we still know right now is that one drug cannot address all the causes. Although there are, I think there are pharmaceutical uh, medications that can help people function better. Um, and many of them are being tested. So it's not that we're anti-drugs, we just don't want drugs to be the problem. And, and you'll see as we go through what I'm, what I'm talking about. This finger study is, um, so these are the original results. The exciting thing about this study is that it's now become worldwide. It started in Finland and it was called the Finnish Geriatric Intervention Study. Um, and you can see it was a much larger population than Dr. Bredesen's and looked at this cohort of between 60 and uh, people 60 to 77 years old. And there were two groups. It was a treatment group and a control group. The control group were like most people, they, they got a checkup once a year. The treatment group received interventions and um, training in nutrition, exercise, cognitive uh, or mental training. And also they had all of their metabolic processes monitored. So things like blood pressure, um, and uh, you know, there was body weight, a, a number of things that were um, you know, kept in mind as they went through, and these were also discussed. So after two years, you'll see there on the right that in every aspect here, complex memory, executive functioning, and even processing speed, which we know declines with age, they all did they all improved and did much better than the control group. So this was the first inkling that these interventions on a larger scale could be helpful. It got the notice of uh, researchers around the country. And I'm happy to tell you that today, it's now called the worldwide, it's called Worldwide Fingers. <laughs> um, and in 2018, they started to recruit groups um, to, to further this research and their trials in the US, China, Singapore, and Australia. Um, they're, they're trying to get the more efforts uh, toward, toward these studies, South America, Canada, India, Japan, South Korea, and Malaysia. So this is definitely caught on and they, they've seen wonderful results from these interventions on things like blood pressure, of course, but even on things like diabetes, which is very closely related to memory loss. So you might ask, why haven't you heard about this? Maybe some of you have, and I'd be delighted to hear that. But many people haven't heard about this because traditional doctors typically haven't been trained in medical school to treat many of the causes of memory loss. And again, this is a whole new way of thinking about the brain. So a lot of times they don't have the tools at their disposal.
disposal to help your patients. So the other aspect of this that's important for us to just understand and be aware of politically is that a lot of the research has been funded in the past by pharmaceutical companies who also are closely aligned with the medical schools. And I'm gonna share with you today some things that you can start doing, literally go to your pantry and start making some changes in your diet. No one's gonna get rich off of that. You know, no one's gonna get rich off of helping you um, de-stress or learn to meditate or sleep better. Um, well, maybe some sleep specialist doctors, but I think you see where I'm going with this. This is not gonna to lead to lots of drugs. And so the research funding has been either, like Dr. Bredesen's first study was all privately funded and he had the hardest time getting more dollars to do a follow-up study, even though his was the only successful study in reversing cognitive decline. Um, so now we're, re we're relying on the government pretty much um, and some nonprofits the Alzheimer's Association is um, because, as you know, they raise lots of money and they are putting some of it toward this type of research. So I'm I'm thrilled to say that. Um, so we'll be seeing we'll be seeing more about this, um, but I, I just wanted to make you aware of of that situation. So I'm going to quickly go through the um, the addressable causes of dementia that Sharp Again Naturally has, uh, you know gathered in this list. Um, we will be talking more about nutritional imbalances, so I'm not going to talk about that here. Um, toxins are a big issue. Um, and in future presentations, you'll, you'll probably hear more about this. We talk a lot about toxins, but they're everywhere. And we have to make sure that we protect ourselves and we're not ingesting more chemicals, uh, food additives, um, you know, air, air pollutants, because what happens is they build up in the body over time. And again, very subtle, it's cumulative, but at some point the body tips, you know, the balance tips. Effects of prescription and other medications. Um, so this is not just the interaction of drugs, it's also side effects. Many drugs have beneficial um, you know, results, but they also have side effects that can be pretty debilitating. So I don't know if you've read the, the inserts of some medications, but it can say it can cause dizziness, disorientation, do not operate a car or heavy machinery. These things can add to memory issues. Heavy metal toxicity. I alluded earlier to things like mercury, lead, aluminum. Um, again, this accumulates in, usually in the fatty tissues of the body. It can be, depending upon your own genetic makeup, it can be pretty easy to detoxify or very difficult. Um, it's thought that people with the APOE4 gene don't detoxify well. And so, uh, if, if you know you, or, or if you have the MTHFR mutation. So that's a mutation that again, also doesn't allow the body to metabolize um, metals. And so I actually have that and I, I take something, I go to a functional medicine doctor and I, I take a supplement that helps me with that. So again, you know, I think knowing your own body is, is three quarters of the battle hormonal and different uh, imbalances. So the genetic, um, I'm sorry, the gender hormones, estrogen, um, testosterone, progest uh, progesterone, uh, those are the main ones. Then you have human growth hormone, um, cortisol, cholesterol, you know, a lot of these hormones in the body, some of them, if they're too low, they provide they produce memory problems, some of them if they're too high. Cortisol, for example. Um, usually the gender hormones, if they're too low, it might cause memory issues. Low level infection. So 
This is a lot about inflammation. And many of the things that you'll see on this list can lead to inflammation in the body. Um, infections are a big one and they can be undetected. Many of them are undetected. So that's why we spend time on them. Oral infections doesn't always mean that you're gonna have pain, but you can have infections in an oral cavity. Lyme's disease definitely has a dementia component. We learned this from one of the people who attended one of our early um, talks who was 27 years old and had a very bad case of Lyme and talked to us about the confusion and the memory loss she was experiencing. Mold, again, one of those sort of systemic problems that we're exposed to a lot, um, especially people in warmer climates. And you kind of live with it, you can smell it a little bit, the mildew, but if you're exposed to this all the time or frequently, it gets into your system and it can cause problems with uh, breathing, which is, you know, then you're having problems with uh, hypoxia and not getting enough oxygen. And then finally, um, food sensitivities or food allergies can cause inflammation in the body. And the UTI is urinary tract infections. These are just some of the big ones. You know, most elders, if you're in your 80s or 90s and you have an undetected urinary tract infection, you, you will present exactly like you have uh, dementia. Number seven, I like to say is our, you know, lifestyle, our lifestyle causes. Inadequate physical, so not enough exercise, not enough mental stimulation, and loneliness or social isolation. And, you know, with COVID, this one in particular has taken a really hard hit, not only for older people, for everyone. Um, you know, they're calling it like the COVID-15, like you had your freshman 15, people are putting on weight and they're, um, you know, hopefully staying more stimulated through some of these programs like we're doing today. But, um, you know, if they're used to going out with friends and, um, you know, interacting at church or their synagogue, um, you know, other places of worship, other activities, that's been severely curtailed and it has an impact on the brain. Prolonged stress. So chronic stress is a problem. I think many of us don't realize we are under prolonged stress. Um, the idea of stress is to motivate us and to get us into the fight or flight mode if we're in a dangerous situation. But we're not, our, you know, the human beings are not designed to exhibit experience stress long-term. So this becomes an issue because it causes inflammation in the body, it raises cortisol levels, and it starts to affect the brain. Sleep and breathing problems, we're gonna talk more about that, so I'm not gonna stay on that. Uh, physical and emotional trauma. So it's only, you know, it's through a lot of research that we realize that trauma that's experienced in childhood leads to memory problems in midlife and dementia later on and certainly physical trauma. So we're talking about traumatic brain injury or, or PTSD. Um, all of these things lead to memory loss if they're not treated. And again, I think a lot of this was under the radar for a while, but now we know how important it is. So again, there's more information on all these things on our website. So we're gonna start with brain health. And we are gonna take a break after brain health in case you have some questions, we'll take a few and then I'll, I'll continue into the sleep um, discussion. And then at the very end, we'll have a, a kind of a longer Q&A. Um, so please write down your questions or put them in the chat box and Sharon will monitor those and then we'll take them um, after we're done. So what does good nutrition do for the brain? Uh, so I, I should take a step back. The brain and the body are one entity not two. So anything that's good for the body is good for the brain and, and vice versa. So it's just something that we, we just need to keep in mind. Um, good nutrition will give us the energy we need. We'll get our nutrients, you know, our, uh, our minerals and our vitamins. Um, it will hydrate us. And, you know, one of the things that we know is that as we get older, our thirst mechanism tends to weaken. And many of us are walking around dehydrated all the time. 
it detoxifies us in that it keeps all the systems in the body working well. So, you know, you hear people who have chronic constipation, um, who have issues with their lymph system. So we're talking about the lymph, the circulatory system, your cardiovascular system, your elimination system, hydration and water. I'm putting in a plug for water here um, because it doesn't have sugar in it and it's pure hydration for the body. It's very, very important. Poor nutrition will do these things. It'll de destabilize, destabilize your blood sugar, which is a, you know, there's a direct connection with memory. Create inflammation, which I've talked about. Damage your microbiome. So let me just stay on that for one second. So the vagus nerve connects the brain to your gut. And the gut is often referred to as your second brain. We need to keep our gut microbiome, right, the bacteria in our gut healthy because it'll, it, it, our immune system will be much stronger that way. Um, we'll digest our food better. We won't get, you know, we won't have bloating. We won't, we won't feel uncomfortable. We won't have reflux. Um, you know, reflux has become so common. People think that everyone has it. So it's, it's like, okay, it's not okay, it's not normal. So our microbiome is really important when it comes to overall health and brain health. Poor nutrition will cause us to be tired, uh, have brain fog. It's really directly connected to mental health as well. So we wanna make sure we're getting good nutrition. Um, and also depression I can't say it causes memory loss, but there's a really strong correlation. So again, depression is something to get treated, but one of the things to look at is your diet. And then it builds up your toxic load. And I, I said that earlier, if you're eating foods that have lots of pesticides, herbicides, um, food colors, flavorings, preservatives, artificial stuff, that's what we're talking about. So what can you do? Here's some, here's some ideas. Limit your consumption of simple carbohydrates. These are white foods typically, not, not like onions, but I'm saying like white flour, white sugar, white rice, you know, plain pastas. Um, all of these things turn into sugar in the body. Complex um, carbs are things like um, whole grains, right? And our fruits and vegetables. Those are also carbohydrates, but they're healthier for you. GMOs are genetically modified foods. There's a lot of controversy about these foods. There's a lot of genetically modified ingredients now in many of our foods. We don't feel they're healthy by and large, uh, and especially a large diet of them. So it's something we caution people about. And then other processed foods that come in boxes, cans, uh, bags, you know, a lot of packaging, those typically are not the healthiest foods for us. We want you to add healthy fats. So you know, healthy fats are fats. So we don't, you know, you don't want to overdo anything in, in quantity, but walnuts, you know, they're shaped like the brain. They're good for the brain. Walnuts are good. Avocados, um, olive oil and olives, nuts and seeds, many kinds of nuts and seeds. Coconut oil, again, very controversial. But coconut oil, is a, it's a vegetable oil. It comes from a, from a healthy food. The MCT oil in coconut oil, it's the um, medium chain triglycerides. That's the oil that turns into ketones in your liver and that can provide an alternative energy but, source. How are you listening? Um, I'm listening, but... Oh. Can we... Can we... Yeah, I'm listening, but... Can we mute um, the listeners? Yeah. Great, thanks. Okay, so flax and chia seeds, also wonderful. If you, if you ever have, I don't know if any of you know what chia seeds are, but when you put them in water, they kind of expand. 
They look a little like tapioca. And so chia seeds are also one of those wonderful things that are high in omega-3s and keep our guts functioning well. The smash fish. So that's salmon, mackerel, anchovies, um, sardines, and uh, herring. Those fish are the highest in omega-3s. And so they're, they're referred to as the smash fish and they're, they're good for us. And then seaweed is also another good source of lots of minerals and, and not necessarily fat as much as it's a high quality food. Other things you can do to boost your nutrition. Improving your vitamin, mineral, and nutrient intake. So there, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it today, but there are certain vitamins that we know are tied very closely to brain health. Vitamin B12 is one of them. Uh, B6, you know, many of the B vitamins. Um, you know, turmeric we know is great for the brain because it reduces inflammation. Um, pre and probiotics, you know, these sorts of things. So that's what we're talking about. I've already covered that next one. So prebiotics and probiotics can tend to be a little bit confusing, like what are these things? Um, and prebiotics are typically um, very, very fiber rich. Um, so they're things like uh, garlic and greens and leeks and asparagus. Um, the allium family, which is, is all your, you know, oniony kinds of foods. Um, probiotics really feed the gut bacteria. So it's usually things that are fermented like um, sauerkraut or yogurt that has all of those wonderful probiotic strains. Um, kimchi, uh, which is a, a Korean dish. Um, you might've heard of kombucha. That's a tea that has a lot of uh, pro probiotics in it. So there are ways to help increase this in your diet. Hydration we've talked about. And minimizing these pesticides and herbicides. So how, I don't know how many of you have heard of the Clean 15 and the Dirty Dozen, but the Environmental Working Group, which is ewg.org, puts out a list every year. And I just, change this slide for the 2020 clean 15 and the, excuse me, and the dirty dozen. So the dirty dozen on top are those fruits and vegetables that contained the most herb, you know, most pesticides, herbicides. Um, they also may be genetically modified, but these are the fruits and vegetables that are recommended that you buy organic. The ones on the bottom are ones that you can feel fairly comfortable buying conventional. And so you can go onto EWG and download this list yourselves and keep it in your wallet when you do your shopping. And just finally, I, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this either, but I wanted you to see the kinds of things that impact your gut microbiome. So if you've taken a lot of antibiotics in your life, if you rely on Advil or ibuprofen to feel good every day, um, if you've been exposed to some of these other things, these will impact your gut microbiome. So you can assess what your risk is and um, just keep these things in mind. So we are going to pause here and if you have a question about nutrition or something that I've mentioned, you can put it in the uh, chat box. Uh, Sharon, I don't know if you have any questions there yet. Uh, yes, Lisa, we do. Um, you, you talked about um, you know, uh, hypertension and diabetes, but uh, Brittany asked, um, it, Actually, she asked about hypertension and diabetes, um, how it contributes to dementia. Now, Tracy did, uh, was gracious enough to give her a, a brief explanation, but if you would like to uh, elaborate on that, Lisa? You know what, I would, those are important questions, but I'd really like to stick with nutrition because I think we can get off on a lot of um, tangents. Um, okay. You know, I mean, just briefly, any, anything that is going to disrupt 
the systems in your body, like your cardiovascular system. I mean, I, I talked about this a little bit, um, or diabetes, insulin resistance leads, you know, you've got a much higher likelihood of getting dementia if you have diabetes. I mean, it's been lots of studies on it. So again, all of these um, things that impair the functioning of the body typically impair the functioning of the mind. Um, and so my, my orientation as a health coach is to say, what can you do that doesn't involve drugs to get these markers down? And research has shown that there's a lot you can do, especially for, for diabetes. Hypertension is one of those things, it might be genetic, so you might have to do a combination of things. Um, it's, it's just, it's, it's a matter of not taking a pill necessarily first. I'm not saying medication isn't necessary for some people, but is there something else you can do to try to get those things under control? Okay, and um, Carol asks, what is your take on Prevagen? Oh, Prevagen. Yes. So Prevagen uh, is a product that is for memory health and it uses um, a jelly, I think um, a derivative of jellyfish or something like that, um, which is high in acetylcholine, um, and acetylcholine uh, that's one thing that can improve some people's memory. Um, it's not a pre prevention. It, it's not a complete treatment. And it typically doesn't work long term, is what I have heard and read. Um, it can help some people in the short term if that's your issue if you're low in that. Okay, um, Marilyn, um, I, I'm sorry, call us, uh, please list the smash fish again. Sure, mm -hmm. salmon uh, and mackerel, but not, not um, king mackerel, okay? King mackerel is too big a fish. When the fish get too big, they're in the ocean a long time, they eat, they're in the ocean a long time. <laughs> I'm gonna focus on that. They also eat a lot of smaller fish and they accumulate mercury in their flesh so that when we eat those very big fish like tuna, like uh, king mackerel, swordfish, shark, uh, we are ingesting those heavy metals as well. So again, salmon, mackerel, um, anchovies, uh, sardines, and herring. Those are, those are the five that tend to be smaller fish, high in omega-3 oils, and healthier for us, for our brain. Next from Rajit, Rajit, he says, are the dirty dozens to be avoided, reduced in the overall diet, or used if they are organic? Yes. The dirty dozen definitely you can use if they are organic. I will also caution you to wash all of your fruits and vegetables, whether they are organic or not. Because let's say you buy a cantaloupe and the outside rind has been contaminated. If you put your knife through that rind and then through the flesh, you're drawing it straight through the, the fruit. So make sure to, I use a veggie wash, a fruit and veggie wash, but at least rinse well all of your fruits and vegetables regardless regardless if they're organic or not now you know it's it's usually the 80 20 rule in my house um you know i cook a lot um when we would go out to dinner we don't do that very much right now but when we were going out to dinner you know if my husband wanted to order um sauteed spinach you know go for it um it's 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 on the dirty dozen list but 20% of the time, it probably won't do too much damage. Um, you know, but, but be, you know, I, I just want people to be vigilant and have the information and, and to know, and then they can make their own uh, determination. Um, of course, if you could avoid it totally, that would be great. 
you know, that's even better. Okay, we have a couple of requests for you to um, uh, put up that last slide. I guess they would like to take screenshots. Mm -hmm. That one. Yes. And uh, Deborah asked, uh, can you give examples of supplements or cognitive games that might help um, memory loss? Cognitive games or supplements? Am I here? Cognitive games? Games. G-A-M-E-S. Oh, games. Okay. Like exercises. Yes. Okay. So as of right now, to my knowledge, there may be others, but for a long time, Brain HQ, which is a website by Posit Science, their research was the only one accept, accepted because Luminosity also tried to to get on the bandwagon, but only brainhq.com has the kind of mental exercises that are, were shown to actually improve brain function. Now you saw in the finger study that there were things that they did that also stimulated the brain and improved the brain. And so, I mean, I, I could talk, about, I'm gonna talk about this later, but I'll just say it now that you want to do new things, try new things. Um, do something as silly as using the other hand to brush your teeth in the morning. Um, try, try going someplace and driving a different way. Don't keep things in the same, do things exactly the same way day to day. Um, that is what really helps to stimulate your brain when you're not talking about brain HQ. Um, I hope that's helpful. Um, you know, they say that things like, you know, doing word searches and crossword puzzles and that sort of thing, you know, keep, keeps the brain agile. It's, it doesn't necessarily help with memory. Um, so it's important to look at the research. All right, I think we should probably go on at this point. And if you have more questions around things I've already covered, um, save them and we'll, we'll do them at the end. So next thing we're gonna look at is sleep and breathing problems. So I wanted, I wanted to put this up here because I was preparing a talk to some doctors actually on sleep and I was, kind of taken aback when I started seeing that these risk factors were so similar. So if there's anything that I can say that will stress how important sleep is for your brain, this gives you just an initial look at that. Um, okay. So, let's talk about seven to eight hours of sleep. You know, for a long time, people wore four or five hours of sleep as a real badge of honor. I don't need that much sleep. I can get so much more done. Um, we know that elders, you know, as people get older, it, it, it's, their sleep is a little broken up. It, it's their, they don't sleep as soundly typically. However, the research shows that we need as much sleep when we're 70 as we did when we were 40. We need seven to eight hours or thereabouts. So, and this is the kind of sleep we're talking about that, that you're not taking sleeping pills to get because when you take a sleep aid, it's a different sleep to your brain and your body. Um, people ask, I'll address melatonin because people ask me about that a lot. So melatonin is natural. The body makes melatonin. Melatonin can be used if you're having a tough time. You know, maybe you're, you're going through a particularly stressful time, but it shouldn't be used long-term every night. Um, but it can be useful um, periodically. Sleep also consolidates your memory. So this is our, our REM sleep, you know, when we're dreaming that lighter sleep. That's often where it's thought that our memories are consolidated. So when you want to 
you know, remember things, right, uh, that you've done that day, if you don't sleep well that night, you're going to lose some of that. It, you're, those memories are not going to be consolidated as well. Sleep does improve your insulin utilization. So again, you know, this is that connection with uh, diabetes. You, you want to keep your insulin under control. Um, and believe it or not, sleep really helps you do that. Like if you monitored your uh, blood sugar in the morning when you wake up, you'll notice that if you don't get a good night's sleep one night, it will be higher. I mean, I've had that experience myself. Um, it improves your focus, outlook, and mental health. I, I don't think I need to say much more about that. I mean, we're all better drivers when we're, when we're rested. Um, we do everything better when we're rested. This is critical. Um, you detoxify, your brain sloughs off plaques. They go into your cerebral spinal fluid during deep sleep, those deep, deep stages of sleep. So it's critical that you experience that deep sleep every night, if possible. I mean, that's, that's why we sleep. It's one of the reasons why we sleep. Um, if not, these build up in the brain and we know that you know, they're, they're problematic. Um, Dr. Bredesen in his research showed that the people who had regained their cognition had good sleep habits. And we're gonna talk about what those are, but essentially they were sleeping at least seven to eight hours a night. I love this um, illustration. It shows people in your brain vacuuming up all the, the stuff, the, the, <laughs> the plaques or the, you know, the detritus that you have in your brain. So like I said, there are many studies that show how sleep really helps to detoxify the brain. So what are our common sleep problems? Many people can't fall asleep or they fall asleep just fine, but they wake up because they have to go to the bathroom or, or they sleep great for six hours or five hours and then they wake up and they cannot fall back to sleep or they sleep next to someone or sometimes in the room next to someone who wakes them because they're snoring or they gasp for air because they've got sleep apnea. So does this sound familiar to people in this group? Okay, so this is, so what do we do? I mean, we're gonna talk about what we can do. Do not eat or exercise within three hours of retiring. So not only is this important because you don't want to go to bed too full or to be too stimulated, um, Dr. Bredesen also added um, fasting for 12 hours between dinner and breakfast the next morning. And if you look at the intermittent fasting folks, they do that for 16 hours. And why, do, why would you do that? Some people do it for weight control, but where the brain is concerned, it resets your gut microbiome. So it has a beneficial effect on the gut, which in turn helps the brain. You wanna create a positive sleep environment. That's, that's the room you sleep in. So what does that look like? It could be making sure you don't have any ambient light, only using your bedroom for, for sex and sleep and not using it for, for other things. Don't keep your, um, you know, your electronics next to your, you know, on your night table. And that includes clocks that have LED displays. Um, so, this is something that health coaches work with people on all the time. You wanna to go to bed and wake up each day at the same time if possible. That's, a, that's really, this is called like sleep architecture and it's getting into routines that really help you sleep better. Try a stress buster to bring your energy down and relax. So I know for me, if I take an Epsom salts bath with lavender in it, lavender oil, I, I really, and much more apt to go to sleep and sleep well. Um, don't try not to read. I know this is, um, you know, 
I might, might get a book thrown at me if I were in a room, but try not to read on your devices before you go to bed because they're stimulating. You know, try to read an actual book uh, with pages that you turn. Um, it really is better for your, your body and your brain. Um, listen to some music or a, um, anyway, each of us has our own ways of reducing stress. So I encourage you to, to find yours. Get off electronics two hours before sleep. Um, this is really important for me personally. There are a few things that, that will really disrupt my sleep. One is this, one is sugar, and the other is alcohol. And I know like last night before this presentation, I wanted to get a good night's sleep. So I knew what I had to do personally to make, to make that happen. We've sort of talked about, and also if you're the kind of person that wakes up in the middle of the night because you have to go to the bathroom, try to limit your fluids. Um, you know, in t maybe right after dinner, like some people enjoy a cup of tea, but then let that be it until you actually go to bed. Exercise earlier in the day. Um, you have to experiment with that. Um, there are people who don't love to exercise in the morning and would rather do it, let's say in the late afternoon, and that's fine, but don't exercise within a couple hours before going to sleep. It's usually pretty stimulating. And for each of us, I mean, determine the root causes of why you're not sleeping well. Um, maybe see a sleep specialist, um, you know, work with a coach, but figure this out. There are ways we can help you figure this out. It's important. Okay, so th those are my, you know, my few comments on sleep. Um, I know this is a big problem for many people because I know it is for, for my family and friends, people talk to me about it. So, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions, but I really encourage you to, you know, to work on this. And maybe this is something that you'll take away from the talk today. Any, any uh, questions, Sharon? Um, we have 15 minutes to go and we don't have any questions in the chat box right now. So we, we would like to ask people to raise their hand if they have any particular questions. Um, actually, one just came in. Okay. Our aunt, uh, from Maryland, our ancestors had two sleeps. Do the eight hours need to be consecutive or can it be interrupted? So that's a good question because we, ha we usually have at least two sleep cycles a night um, that will give us the full deep sleep and REM sleep that we need. Um, you know, I would caution you to try to function well on four hours of sleep. That's the only problem um, about breaking it up. But, you know, if you can sleep six and then take a nap, um, that's better than not sleeping your eight, you know, if it has to be broken up in some way. Um, you know, I think in the interest of time, I probably should continue uh, on and we'll take questions at the end, okay? Okay. So I want to encourage everyone to think that um, there might be more than one thing going on for them. Uh, not just one of these causes that I've talked about. Um, and again, you know, if you have no symptoms, you might not be motivated to really look at, at all of these. But um, just know that people who present with symptoms of memory loss often have more than one cause. So people do ask about genetics, and I talked a little bit about the APOE4 gene, but what we learned from the original finger study is that even people who had a 3-4 a or a 4-4 in terms of their APOE4 makeup, um, they were able to significantly delay, if not prevent, their onset of memory loss. So. The takeaway here is that genes don't have to be your destiny and epigenetics are very powerful. Um, 
And I think many of us have heard about genes getting switched on and get switched off. So things that we've talked about like exercise and reducing toxic load and things like that will help to keep your genes you know, healthier. So health span versus lifespan means that you live well longer in a nutshell. And so we're trying to get to line B here where you're 80, you know, 80 to 90 years old and you've lived well up until maybe the very, very last year or six months or two days of your life, but that you're not ill for 10 to 15 or 20 years of your life. This is really the goal is to stay active, is to stay vibrant, is to stay healthy. So it, when, we, um, when we do presentations in person, we give out a card that we've converted now into these two slides. And these are things that we can do now and they cover really all of, all of the, um, the causes. So some we've already talked about, mo many we've already talked about, but for those we haven't, you'll see them here. So we did cover this, eat whole unprocessed foods and less sugar, hydrate. I really can't say enough about hydration. I know people don't like to hear about it and very, there are a lot of people who don't love water and we have so many other options uh, of what we can drink, but nothing really substitutes for water. And frankly, if you're drinking, um, for, well, let me just say it this way, for every glass or cup of caffeinated drink, it could be coffee, it could be tea, iced tea, you need really two glasses of water to make up for it because your body the caffeine, it acts like a diuretic, right? It just, it pulls more fluid out of your body. And people are not that, you know, excited about doing that. So I'm gonna <laughs> caution you to try to keep your caffeinated beverages to maybe a couple a day at the most, because otherwise you're depleting your body of fluid. So I usually use the example of like if you go, if you're walking in town and you go behind a, a truck that's idling, hold your breath. You know, don't inhale those toxins. If you're on the tarmac at, at an airport and you can smell the fuel, try not to, you know, take big breaths and, and breathe that in. That particulate matter has to be detoxified in your liver. And again, these things do build up. So it's not just in your environment. It could be, you know, you could have, you could get new furniture and it off gases the chemicals that were used, um, formaldehyde, you know, chemicals are everywhere. They're in our, they're in our beauty products. Um, they're in our household cleaning products. This is a whole, you know, discussion unto itself. I'm just encouraging you to read labels and reduce the number of chemicals and toxins you're exposed to. Um, aerobic exercise and strength training. So aerobic exercise gets us to sweat, helps us to stay healthy, gets our heart rate up, releases toxins in the sweat, which is great. Um, it's why it's important. You can even do fast walking and it will, it, you'll break a sweat. The strength training piece is important, not only for our muscles, but also for our balance. As we age, we need to, um, you know, if you, you've probably all heard that people who show signs of Alzheimer's or dementia, their gait slows. So exercise and the strength and flexibility training help keep you, you know, keep your brain healthy and keep you sharp. We talked about challenging your brain, how you can do that. Spending time with family and friends. I know it's been very difficult. I, I encourage people to do even Zoom calls with, with family and friends. Um, 
manage your stress. You know, stress is so ubiquitous. You know, everyone feels it. We're, we're all under a lot of stress, especially today with what's going on in the world. We need to find ways that work for us. It's, it's a very individual thing, but find things that work for you and, and do them. And we, we can provide, you know, on the website, I'm sure we have a list that, that there's a lot of things that can help you manage stress. We covered the sleep issue, breathing issues. So this whole idea of disordered breathing or narrowed airways is, is new. Um, but we see it in children. And if those breathing issues are not treated and that airway is not, you know, released and, and uh, freed up, that people don't have enough oxygen. And if this happens over time, usually it leads to memory issues, but you see this a lot in people who are mouth breathers. They, they sit with their mouths open. Um, you see it a lot in children. So that's why this is important to have it treated. Um, I mean, sleep apnea is, is another issue, but even, you know, very, we used to think of sleep apnea in people who are very heavy and men with thick necks, but thin women have sleep apnea and also this narrowed airway problem. So it's important to, to get those looked at. The fasting we spoke about, getting help for trauma, we spoke a little bit about at the beginning. Um, it's, imp it's important, it will have residual effects. So protecting your brain, this sounds pretty obvious, but I'm amazed at the number of people that I hear about who fall, um, sometimes while doing sports and they don't have, for example, they fall off a bike and don't have a helmet on, or they fall when they're skiing and they, they have a concussion. Um, even if you fall in your home, you can, you can hurt your brain. And we just, our last newsletter was just on this issue, traumatic brain injury. And the, doc, the two doctors who contributed to that issue said it doesn't take a lot. Even if you're in a, just a small fender bender, the jarring of the brain against the skull is enough to cause, you know, you've heard of the cytokine storm that they talk about with COVID, the, um, you know, the inflammation, it's enough to cause that kind of a reaction, a cytokine reaction. So protecting your brain is really important. And again, don't wait if you sense a memory problem. So I talked, you know, a little bit about the fact that we've done programs now, and this is fairly new for us, but we want people to understand and be able to not only take the information, be able to operationalize it. So this year we've started webinars. Um, we've started small groups where people can be educated further about some of the things I talked about today, but can also work on their own issues. Or again, because it's very individual. And so we have health coaches that are helping to run these groups. And then we also do individual one-on-one -on -one health coaching, especially for people who are in that subjective mild stage where intervention is really, it could, it, it could help tremendously. Um, so we do make these available and there's more information on our website. So I would love for you to just take a moment to write in the chat box one or two things that you will do just based on the talk today, starting today to take care of your brain. I'd love for you to share that and then maybe at the end, Sharon will, will share some of those answers with us. So I've, um, I've talked about our website. It talks about the causes in detail. We have recovery stories. Um, we're actually revising our website so there will be more on our new website um, but we have resources, recipes, some videos. You can join our email list. So feel free to go to sharpagain.org. And I just wanted to leave you with the possibility of what the future could look like in terms of our brain health. 
what if we all got an assessment at age 40 when our brains are still functioning relatively well? At least we would know where we're starting from. And then what if we had regular cognitive checkups, you know, maybe every other year or so until the age of 60, and then maybe after that it was every year. What if there were centers, and there are starting to be some centers now uh, that treat the causes of memory loss? And what if we train doctors to recognize and treat the early signs of memory loss? What if they took people seriously and listened to their subjective cognitive symptoms? And what if we, and we will train more health coaches to support the lifestyle changes and personal health goals that we all have? And what if we all could be active in helping to reduce the toxins that we're all exposed to in the environment? So I leave you with that vision. Uh, it's Sharfigan's vision for the future. And I thank you very much. I hope this has been helpful. Thank you, Lisa. I think it was, it was definitely helpful to me. So Sharon, you wanna go ahead? And I think there were a few questions. And one of the questions I saw up front um, is will you all uh, provide the slides for this? I can always send the recording to folks, but I know that was asked up front. So we typically don't share the slides themselves, but because, because especially you are providing the recording, so people can always do screenshots or take down information if they, if they need it. Well, it sounds like a lot of this is on your website too. So, yeah. Um, so Sharon, um, I see there were a few more questions yes. and certainly go ahead and share those comments. Okay. And, and also uh, for, the, uh, for those who submitted questions that we weren't able to get at, we're, uh, we did, uh, we recorded them and we will submit them to Lisa for, uh, you know, to respond to you. So here are some of the takeaways that uh, people um, have shared. Carl said he's determined to drink more water. Yes. And uh, Wendy, Wendy uh, feels petting cats is awesome. And uh, we can, uh, petting cats, yes. And uh, getting more sleep determined um, Katie is determined to get more sleep. Um, let's see, uh, one, that's Marilyn will try to eat better and fast for 12 hours at night. Antoinette says, be more mindful of her food intake. Brittany, to get more, get rid of canned raviolis. <laughs> <laughs> Roseanne will get to bed at the same time every night. Yes. And Victor determines to um, eat more organic foods and hydrate daily. Barbara will watch her sugar intake, fewer cookies, thanks to this program. Wendy loves anchovies and will incorporate them into her diet more often. I don't love them. I want to try to love them. <laughs> <laughs> Brenda also will uh, determine to drink more water and continue intermittent fasting. Okay, this one. Any, are there any qu any other questions that have come in that you wanted to? Well, there was one particular question I did want to uh, to present. Lois asks, Lois says that she uses a yoga app at night on her cell. And um, she always turns off the screen, so there's no blue light, but is that okay? Yeah, you know, it, it, well, my question to you is, is that okay? Like, are you falling asleep fine? If you are, the, a phone is better than a computer because of the amount of light. And if you do turn off the, the light, that's good. Um, and if it's not interfering with your sleep, you know, I think that's the real test. I would just encourage you not to keep a, um, any kind of electronic device in, in your bedroom. Like if you can leave it out in another room, 
I think just in general, the electromagnetic frequency does have an impact on our body, not only on our brains, but in different ways. Um, you know, a lot of the research that's coming out. So how do, how do you know what time it is? You know, when you, when you have to get up. Well, <laughs> I mean, you can use a clock. Watch your alarm clock and try not to look at your alarm. The UV radiation from electronic devices tell the brain that it's daytime, not nighttime, so you won't be able to fall asleep. I have a watch next to my bed that I look at. Yeah, there are watches, there are clocks that have the, um, that you can read them. They have the displays that light up, you know, the little crystals in them, but the, it's not, it's, it's not an LED display. Um, but you're right, you know, the body, that's part of the blue light issue with computers. It, it messes with the melatonin and the body doesn't know it's time to go to sleep. Um, and it is, it, it's so important to keep, I mean, if the light bothers you in the early mornings to find a way, I have to, I do wear a, a, an eye mask. Uh, I mean, sometimes I'll stir around five and I'll just, I'll put it on because if I want to sleep past the time it's getting light out, it becomes very hard for me. Uh, I'm sensitive to light. So that can make a difference. But again, these are all, you know, little strategies and things that you learn to do. Lisa, last question for you before we close our sessions. Eva asks, what does the test for the dementia consist of? As well as um, there was a question, uh, what is the cost to get personalized cognitive help? So, um... Wait, with the, remind me of the first one. I was reading a- The first a one is, uh, what does the test for dementia cost or consist of? So the, the test consists of, well, it depends. You know, if you go, if you go to a big memory care center, like a hospital memory care center, they're gonna put you through paper and pencil tests, they'll do an interview. They may even do an interview with a spouse or a loved one. Um, you know, that's, you, you, many of you probably have heard, they make you like draw a clock and they see how well you're able to draw a clock. Um, <laughs> they ask you, if you go to your neurologist, they'll ask you to remember like five words and then later in the conversation, they'll probably come back to that. They'll ask you to, you know, count backwards by sevens um, from a hundred. I mean, there are lots of different ways. So some of them are, uh, you know, they're administered orally. Um, typically that's what my dad's neurologist would do with him. Um, some of them have to do with uh, dexterity. They, you know, they'll ask you to do certain things with your fingers, you know, touch different things and be able to touch your nose like this and do other things. Um, I think typically, you know, doctors, uh, especially like your primary care physician will do something pretty rudimentary. That's what I was saying. And even neurologists sometimes, it just doesn't pick up on the early stages. Um, in terms of the cost of getting help, uh, you know, where our, our small groups, um, we priced at $20 a session, 20 or 25, we're, we're just kind of finalizing that because we want it to be affordable for, for people. Individualized health coaching is, is a monthly, there's a monthly cost and people typically will commit to either three months or six months. So if you're interested in that, please um, contact Sharp again. I'm happy to talk with you about that. Thank you, Lisa. That, that wraps up our Q and A. Yeah, just gonna see if you could type in your, um email address so people know how to contact. I know they can definitely go to the website and they'll hear again from me, but. Um, right. Try all the different methods. Okay. So. I'll put it, I'll put it right in the chat box. That'd be perfect, thank you. Well, I, I am so grateful. I learned a ton today and reinforced some of the things I already knew. And, um, you know, having lost a mother to Alzheimer's, this was particularly important. Um, 
because needless to say, it's on my mind a lot when that um, she was diagnosed. So um, thank you everybody for joining, especially those of you I've never met before. We're really glad to have you and we hope we'll see you again if not on another Zoom session or as a member or somebody out there volunteering in the community. Um, remember that volunteering keeps your happy and healthy and stimulated too. So that's one of those things that's uh, up there on the list to stay sharp. So thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Susan. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. and thank, thank you for all the wonderful work you do, Wendy and Sharon, really. It's, uh, you're, you're really helping keep people sharp. It's great. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Enjoy thank it. You, thank you, everyone. Good to see you guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.